continue our sessions by the sea as Jesus has powerful lessons to teach. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, this is the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, belonged to Peter, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he, Jesus, sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft, for a catch. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we've toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break, began to break, was at the point of breaking. And they beckoned to their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all. And followed him. As we read this text, commenter Daryl Bach notes that here, in this passage, as you begin to read through Luke, he introduces a new theme that hasn't quite come up yet. But he starts from here in the next little bit, introducing a theme, a new element of Jesus' ministry, and that's the gathering of disciples. Look back up at the last part of Luke chapter 4, you see the ministry of Jesus that's caused quite a stir already. People are becoming very interested in him. He's taught in the synagogue, and the, the, the response to Jesus is this is one that teaches with authority. He's not up here telling us what Rabbi so and so says, and Rabbi so and so says, he's teaching us on his own authority. This is astounding. Jesus has cast demons out of demon possessed people. And this is astounding. And Jesus has healed multiple people, including Peter's mom. They brought the sick to Jesus to heal him. And people are, this is causing quite a stir. And people are becoming interested in Jesus. We could see why. So we look at the things that Jesus is doing. But Jesus is going to begin gathering disciples to him. He's going to begin gathering Followers And Bach asks the question, where should Jesus' mission and an interest in Him lead? Okay, you're interested in Jesus, great. Where should that lead you? What type of people come to Jesus? Maybe it's been said to you, I, I hear it from time to time, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't come to your church, Pastor. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good enough to come to church. Is it only good people that... Come to Jesus? Is that the idea? Only the skilled, only the, the, the powerful that Jesus is able to use? Would Jesus be interested in me? Can he use me? How could he make me useful to his mission? I hear people tell me, well, Pastor, I'm, I'm not a teacher. How could he use you? Especially if you're not a teacher. Well, I can never stand up there and talk in front of people. Oh, okay. How could he possibly transform me into somebody that he can use? Well, this passage begins to give us an answer. We see the ministry of Jesus as he's teaching in Capernaum there by the lakeside and and. 
It's a situation where he's caused quite a stir and there's an interested crowd and you know how it is in a, in, in a busy street or busy area where there's something that somebody's presenting or, or speaking and there's an interest generated and the people start to kind of gather around and what happens when you have one person standing here and a bunch of people standing around is that once you get past about the second or third row of people you can't really see what's going on or hear the person. And Jesus is just getting, you just kind of picture him getting back further and further toward the lakeside. And he looks around and he sees over here, here's two fishing boats, probably 20, 30 feet long or so. And, and the fishermen are not in the boats, they're on the bank and they're spreading their ne nets out and they're mending their nets from the night's fishing. And he sees the boat. Peter owns one of the boats, so he gets in Peter's boat. He's already had an introduction, he's already had some relationship with Peter. So he gets into Peter's boat. Peter's busy, by the way. But he asks Peter, could you just push this boat out a little bit? And so Peter gets in the boat with him and, and pushes Jesus out. And Jesus sits down, common position for the teacher. So he's pushed out from the land a little bit, out into the water. So there's a little bit of space between him and the people. And he's able to teach. And that's what's happening. Peter, most likely still there in the boat, would appear that way at least from the way that Jesus says when he's done, he just tells Peter, hey, let's go fishing. Let's launch out into the deep. And uh, so apparently there. So Jesus teaches here, and Luke says that when he finished teaching the crowds, well, he's not done teaching. And Jesus' teaching of Peter is not going to require a lectern or a podium or pre-printed notes. In fact, Jesus is going to take Peter to school right where Peter thinks he's got things together. Peter is a fisherman, professionally. This is his boat. He knows how to fish. And Jesus says to him, Peter... Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a big catch. Now, I've heard preachers take this passage and say, okay, so this is, we're going to talk about evangelism. We're going to talk about winning lost souls. And the first thing you need to do is go where the fish are. Launch out into the deep. Well, that's not where the fish are right now. See, the men aren't out fishing when Jesus starts teaching. Why? Because they're mending their nets. They were fishing at night. When there's no sun, when it's cooler, and when the fish come up from the deep parts of the water closer to the surface. Now it's daytime, and Jesus has been teaching for a while. It's probably pretty warm, and if you want to catch fish at this point, if you go out into the deep water, the fish are going to be down deep. It's harder to catch them now. But Jesus says, let's go fishing. And Simon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. This is kind of a mild rebuke. Listen, Lord, hey, great, great message, Jesus. Listen, great teaching, great sermon. Loved it. Leave the fishing to me. We fished all night. We worked all night. We know what we're doing. We didn't get anything last night. Doesn't make any sense. How does Jesus make us usable? How does Jesus change us? How does Jesus make us usable for him? How does he transform us into what he desires us to be? Well, we see him beginning here with Peter, and we can take from us as well the idea and the truth that, first of all, Jesus transforms me as I simply obey. I'll be transformed as I simply obey. Jesus wants me to obey him. He requires obedience of all or to all of his requests. He wants me to obey. And sometimes his requests seem insignificant. Has Peter already done something Jesus has asked him to do? Yes. Jesus said, hey, can I get in your boat, push the boat out a little bit? Okay. Well, that was exciting. 
Boy, that was some massive, impressive obedience to Jesus. Boy, look at what Peter did for Jesus. What did he do? Push the boat out. Manned the boat while Jesus sat there and taught. That's what Peter did. Sometimes Jesus' requests seem insignificant. But he still wants us to obey. Even in the things that don't seem like a big deal. Even in the things that seem insignificant, he still desires us to obey. This first request that he made from Peter required very little effort. uh, Provided no real excitement I got to wonder if, if, if as Peter's listening, I mean, I, I know Jesus is a great teacher, but you know, you're sitting out there, you've been working all night, you're sitting in that boat, got a little bit of that rocking back and forth going in that boat, that sun's coming down, and you're sitting there listening to Jesus teach. I got to wonder if Peter caught every word, or maybe Peter caught a few winks, possible. This request of Jesus provided no real excitement, no very little notoriety, no visible results. Luke doesn't record anything of significance in response to Jesus' teaching that day. Just, But Jesus said, hey, let me use your boat. Peter said, okay. That's not much. But Jesus begins his transforming work as I simply obey. He wants me to obey, even when the commands or the requests seem insignificant. Sometimes his requests seem unreasonable. He still wants me to obey, especially in those times when the requests seem unreasonable. And it's that unreasonable request that we get to now when Jesus says, hey, let's go out and fish. That's just, that's just not reasonable. That doesn't make sense. It's pointless. Peter and his partners, as we said, have been fishing all night. And they were busy about important business. They were mending their nets getting them ready to use again later, probably ready to go get some rest, get something to eat. They're busy with other important things. And hey, Peter had already given valuable time to the Lord. Jesus has been teaching all morning in Peter's boat, and Peter's been sitting there while Peter had other stuff. He's already given Jesus time today. And now Jesus wants more time. And at the base of it here, we see in Peter's response, Peter knew his business. And he knew, he knew that this exercise of going out fishing right now was pointless. There's no reason to do this. Peter knew how much work he'd already put in. He knew the time for catching fish today was past. Master, we toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, we'll do it. I'll let down the net. It's interesting, the, the, the big nets that they would normally use for the main catch are, are likely still on the land. Maybe there's a couple in the boat, but the net that Peter uses here is not the big one. It's the one that they use kind of to you know, search out and see what's there. A little smaller. That's the word for the net that he's using here. But there's something going on. With this request here, Jesus actually invades Peter's area of expertise. Understand, Peter has witnessed already. He has witnessed Jesus' authoritative teaching. He has seen Jesus casting out demons. He has seen Jesus healing. Jesus healed Peter's mom prior to this. Peter has seen those things, and those are amazing things. But now Jesus is in Peter's boat, in the middle, all up in Peter's business. Peter knows fishing. Christ met Peter right where he lived here, and he's challenging Peter to put Christ's words against all that he, quote, knew already to be true, and then obey Jesus anyway. How does Jesus transform us? That's how. And that is what he's asking of you and me. Especially in those areas where we're convinced, okay, God, I know that's what your word says, but I know better what works for me. I know that's what the way you said to do this, but that doesn't work for me. You've you got to understand my situation. We've talked before about the note from God. 
when you're a kid in, in, in school and you, need to, you get the note to the gym teacher, please excuse Jimmy today, his, his thumb hurts. You know, note from mom, I don't have to participate. We get our notes from God. Okay, I know that's how God says to live, but you don't understand. I've got a note. I've got special permission. I've got special conditions. If God knew my circumstances when he had written that, he wouldn't have written it that way. No, Jesus wants us to put his words in the face of all we think we know to be true and obey him anyway. And that's what he does with Peter. I will be transformed. He'll transform me as I simply obey. He wants me to obey. And that's when he goes to work. Christ uses my obedience as an opportunity to show his power. He wants me to obey and he works as I obey. There's some question among Students of this passage, is this, a, is this a knowledge and guidance miracle where Jesus, just, Jesus knew where some fish were and was able to guide Peter there? Is this a nature miracle where Jesus somehow miraculously called the fish to that place? Does it matter? Not a lot. The point is that Jesus is in control of this situation. And Jesus accomplishes exactly what he wants to. Here Christ shows his power and his knowledge over nature itself. And more importantly for Peter, he shows his power and his knowledge over Peter's domain. Jesus is working where Peter knows best. And shows Peter, no, you don't know best. I know best. Jesus is working where Peter is convinced he's done all that he could possibly do. And Jesus says, you did do all you could possibly do. Now it's my turn. Here Christ begins to show Peter even more specifically who he is. This is the true and living God become truly human. Is Peter going to see that here? He will begin to see it. Will he get it entirely? Not entirely, but boy, he started. Something changes here for Peter. I will be transformed as I simply obey. And understand, that's all Peter did here was just do what Jesus said to do. That's all Peter did. It wasn't anything special. It wasn't anything great. It wasn't anything out of the ordinary. It wasn't anything that anybody else would even notice as being significant. He just did what Jesus told him to do. And it was simply doing what Jesus told him to do that put him in a position for Jesus to begin to do what only Jesus could do. I wonder how many times I have missed the powerful working of Jesus in my life, in my family, or in my church just simply because I had not obeyed in a way that would put me in a position for Jesus to work in a way that he would desire to. I don't know. So one pastor made the statement, I'm, I'm convinced that God wants to bless, and I've said it here, I believe that God wants to bless our church if we'll get out of his way. How do we get out of his way? Do what he says. What dramatic, transformative work has Jesus accomplished in Peter? Right now, Peter's just doing what Jesus says. That's how... God... I want God to transform me and make me his great servant. How does he do that? Just do what he says. That's how he does it. I will be transformed as I simply obey. And with Peter here, I will be transformed as I see God's power. And that's the point. When I do what he tells me to do, it puts me in a position where God's able to work and then I get to see what God can do. And it's God's work that changes me. The results of obedience here, in obedience, I see God. And that's what happens to Peter. 
I'm able to see God at work. This is the God of creation. This is the God who has come in human form. This is the God that must be the object of my faith. Again, we've talked about this many times. But as people use the word faith, the Bible understanding of faith is never some nebulous feeling, never some idea, never some emotion. Faith is believing what God said is true is actually true and acting on that. That's what faith is. Your faith is only as valid as the object of your faith. Your faith may be sincere, but if it's placed in something that can't do what you're trusting it to do, it's not going to help you. Jesus Christ himself needs to be the object of my faith. Peter was beginning here to recognize something about Jesus. Look at at what happens here, this, this scene. So Simon answering says, Master, we've toiled all the night, verse 5, we've taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done it, They enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their nets. Their net's too small. They got more fish than the net can hold. And they beckoned their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came, and they filled both the ships so that the ships and the boats are starting to sink. They got so many fish. Take a minute and just picture. Peter, ho-hum, okay, Lord, whatever. <laughs> If you want to let down the net, we'll, we'll do it. Okay, here you go. Throws the net over. Pandemonium. Fish everywhere. Where did these fish come from? We, got, we don't have room. The, the nets aren't all. Hey, come help. We got fish here. Come in. And the guys are getting in the water. And they're coming out. And both boats. And now they're filling both the boats. And the boats are getting too full. And here's Peter up to his knees in flopping fish everywhere, figuring it out. And the light goes on. And he looks at Jesus. Jesus had to have the biggest grin on his face. I'm sorry. If you see Jesus as just some stoic Shakespearean actor, you know, Jesus had to have such a grin on his face watching these guys. (laughs) Oh, yeah, Peter. Yeah, just let the net down. For me, please, just once. And they are up to their knees in fish. And the light goes on in Peter's mind and he looks at Jesus. This is not a normal man. I heard him teach, and that's impressive. I saw him cast out demons. That's amazing. I saw him heal people. I don't know anybody can do that, and this guy knows my business too. This is, I, I knew all there was to know about this. I, I can't explain this. If you want to see... God at work. We want to wait for Him to do something big and amazing so that we know we can obey Him. He's asking us to do what He tells us to do so He can accomplish something in that and show us Himself. You obey first, and that's when we see God. It's in obedience that I see God. When did this happen? When they let down the net. In obedience, I see God, and in obedience, I see me. Peter turns and looks at Jesus. And Peter's response, when Simon Peter saw it, verse 8, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Something about his demeanor changes. Even the way he addressed Jesus changes. In verse 5, he says, Master, refers to Jesus as Master. And this word has the idea of recognizing one in authority. 
Here he addresses Jesus as Lord, and that, that, is, a for, that is a more formal recognition. Sometimes uh, your translations will say sir, and that bothers some people. It doesn't say, that, that is a valid translation. Some, it's a very formal greeting or formal address, sir. It recognizes authority, but many times, most of the time here, it's a reference to recognition of God and God's presence. One writer said on this change from master to Lord, it's the master whose orders must be obeyed, but it's the Lord whose holiness caused moral agony to the sinner. This reaction from Peter, when nothing is recorded as taking place after earlier miracles, it's probably not due to Luke recording the miracle out of order. Rather, it's because this was a miracle in Peter's own area of expertise. He knew fishing, and he knew what this haul implied. He knew fishing. This is not fishing. He knows what happens when you throw a net in that part of the lake at this time of day. Not this. And this is more, this person in this boat is more than just a rabbi that I have some interest in. This is more than just one who is in a privileged position whose orders I respect. This is one who is greater than me. And there's a very similar response here that we see throughout Scripture when people had their eyes opened to realize that they're standing in the presence of God. It's not a party. See, when I see God for who he is, I see me for who I am. This is the response from Isaiah in Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And he sees the cherubim circling the throne, crying, holy, holy, holy. And the, the, the room is shaking, and the, the house is filled with smoke, and he sees the holiness of God. And Isaiah's response is, woe is me, I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. When I see God for who he is, I see the reality of who I am. I am a sinner. I am unholy. I am undone. In the presence of a God who is perfectly holy and wholly other. And that is the right response. The results, as I obey God and see him work, I see my sinfulness, I see the, how many times have I finally come around to obey and do what God says and I see God work and it just reminds me how much I was disobeying before. Wow, I should have been doing what you said all along. Lord, I have been wrong. The results of obedience here show me my weakness. This is something God alone can do. This is something Peter couldn't do. Lord, I worked all night. I did all I could do. I did the best I could do. I put in the time. I put in the effort. And I couldn't generate anything. Yeah, it's because this is God's work. I'm weak. Now, there are some today who might be bothered that somebody would stand up and say those. I mean, isn't that unhealthy for me to think of myself as sinful and weak? Isn't that bad? Isn't that bad for my self-esteem? Isn't that bad for my mental health? No. No. Because it's true. Deceiving yourself is bad for your mental, <laughs> mental health. But it's healthy because it's that realization that puts us in a position to be able to see a greater truth even than that. Jesus said, you don't send a doctor to people who are well. You send a doctor to people that are sick. Jesus said, I came to call sinners to repent. Well, I'm not a sinner. Well, then Jesus can't help you. Because Jesus came for sinners. Are you overplaying that a little bit? No, read John 9, where Jesus healed that man that was born blind and then made that statement so the Pharisees could hear him. Those that are blind will be able to see, but those that declare we can see will remain blind. The Pharisees heard him say, Are you saying we're blind? Jesus said, If you would admit your blindness your sins would be forgiven. But because you're walking around saying, we can see just fine, thank you very much, your sin remains. So I'll be transformed as I see God's power in obedience. I see God in obedience. I see me in obedience. I see grace. 
Look at Jesus' response. Peter falls down in front of Jesus in the midst of these flopping fish and says, go away from it. Lord, I don't deserve you in my boat. Don't look at me. Go away from me. I'm sinful. Think of the parable that Jesus told about the, 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 the Pharisee and the, and the tax collector who went to the temple to pray. And what did he say about the tax collector? He would not even so much as lift his eyes up to heaven, but being on his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. And Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth, that man went down to his house justified. Peter recognizes who he is, and he recognizes something's going on here with this Jesus, and I don't deserve to be in your presence. Go away from me. I am a sinful man. To Peter's, I am a sinful man, Christ responds, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Jesus' response wasn't, don't be so hard on yourself, Peter. Oh, you're not that bad, Peter. No, you're not a sinner, Peter. No, Jesus' response was, don't be afraid. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. I know. And don't be afraid. See, as we said before, Christ came to save sinners. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. That's why I'm here. Because you are sinful and you need me. Remember the words of Romans chapter 5, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. How are we justified? By faith. And it's by that faith also that we have access into His grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We have peace with God through the work of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to save sinners. So Peter says, I'm a sinful man. Christ says, fear not. To Peter's, go away from me. Christ offers a call. No, you come follow me. Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. No, don't be afraid. I'm coming to you so you can come with me. That's grace. That's grace. The results of obedience, God's grace is real to me. He makes His grace real to me. I understand what a gift is His fellowship. And it's through that that I'm able to become useful in His service. Jesus said to Simon, fear not, verse 10, from henceforth you will catch men. That word catch there, it's, it's, it's the word to, to catch out, to save alive. It's used throughout the Old Testament for God's rescue. What a picture. The one who has spent his life developing his skills in catching fish to put them to death will now become one who is an instrument in the hands of God to catch sinners who are in danger of God's wrath and judgment and catch them and save them alive and bring them into life. Peter and his partners left all. When they had brought their ships to land, they forsook it. Now, now think about this. Again, you're fishermen. This is your business. This is what you do. You've fished all night and haven't caught a thing. And now Jesus takes Peter out in the boat, and they've got so many fish, they've got to get both boats out there, and these boats are sinking full of fish. These guys are going to make bank today. And they get these boats to the shore, and they bring to the shore, and what do they do? They leave it. They just leave it and follow Jesus. What fish? <laughs> Who cares? One writer said this word, henceforth, introduces a new set of circumstances, a turning point has been reached. From now on, things will be different with Peter. The nature of the new life to which Jesus is calling him comes out in these final words. You will be catching men. And the way that he constructs this here, it's a, it's, it's a habitual practice. Peter will no longer be concerned with fish, but with 
people. So when the fishing party got to land, they left everything. They left the greatest catch they'd seen in all their lives. That catch was not as important as what it showed them about Jesus. So they followed him. They became disciples in the fullest sense. He writes. The question here for us, you know, I've, I've, I've preached this passage before, and one of the questions that I asked here is, what, what do you have to leave to follow Jesus? That, that's the wrong question. It wasn't that these disciples had to sit around and do an evaluation. Okay, what do we need to leave in order to follow Jesus? They saw Jesus, and they saw what he was doing, and they saw what he was going to do with them, and they followed. What did they have to leave? doesn't matter. Because I'm not looking at it and saying, okay, well, I can follow Jesus, but I have to leave this and this. and I, I, I need to follow Jesus. You start following Jesus, stuff will get left. It just will. And this call to Peter, this, this response to Peter here, I begin to understand and see where the power for service truly resides. It's in Jesus. It's not in me. What did Peter do at this point that transformed him into a fisher of men? Nothing. This was what Jesus was changing him into. Jesus was doing this work. It's the work of Christ in Peter's life that began to change his direction. Peter just looked at Jesus and says, I don't deserve to be in your presence. I recognize you for who you are. I'm a sinful man. And Jesus says, that's why I'm here. Jesus can forgive Jesus can make us right with him. Jesus can call us to follow him. And Jesus can put us into his mission. What is his mission? Souls, people, disciples. Follow him. Peter responded in obedience to the commands of Christ, even though they went from the insignificant to the unreasonable. And as he answered Christ's call... Christ demonstrated his power in a dramatic way. And as we pointed out earlier, lots of people may have some level of interest in Jesus. But where should Jesus' mission and interest in him lead? Bach asked that question earlier, and he answers, those who respond to Jesus are to follow him in calling people to God. They are to be fishers of people, even though they as fishers are sinners. Who are you to call me to leave everything and follow Christ? I am one that Christ has called to follow him. That's it. I'm following Jesus. Imperfectly. Poorly but with full trust in Him. And that's all I'm calling anybody else to do. That's, that's, that's what it means to follow Jesus. That's, that's what a disciple is. And Jesus says, Peter, just like I'm calling you and I'm going to make you a fisher of men, I'm going to use you to make fishers of men who will make fishers of men. That's, that's what we're doing. That's what it's about. For you and for me today, this has come up for some of us recently. I mentioned it yesterday with some, some guys who we were talking. And, and there's, why, why does God have a church here? Why does he have a church here? I can't help but believe he has a church here because he believes there are some people here that need to know Jesus. Why does he have you where you are? He has you in a particular place in a particular family, in a particular work setting, in a particular circumstance of life. He has you in a particular circle of people. Why? Could it be that he wants some people there to know Jesus? And that's why he has you there. He wants you to follow him and call someone around you to follow him with you. I'm not sure I can do that. I am sure you can't. And I'm sure I can't either. And that's why we follow Jesus. Because Jesus can. He can. And he will. Well, when will I see him do those amazing things? I don't know what you'll see him do, but I know we won't see him do anything until we obey him. 
I won't see him do what he wants to do until I simply obey. So for you, Christ is waiting on you to respond in obedience to him. And maybe your response of obedience is still, maybe you still need, see, see, I can't see anybody's heart again, okay? But maybe for you, the, the, the obedience he needs from you right now is still obedience to that first command, you must be born again. Maybe that's where your obedience starts. I need to turn away from myself and turn to him in repentance. I need to turn from idols to serve the true and living God and to wait for his son from heaven. Maybe that's where your obedience needs to start today. Are you in Christ? Will you bow the knee to him and be saved today? We can talk about that. I'd love to. What does obedience look like? A lot of shapes, but here's one area of obedience. Lord, I want to start praying that you would use me to be the instrument of your grace in the life of somebody I know. Would you give me that one person that I can lead to Christ? Maybe start there with that prayer. And maybe find somebody here that has that same heart and say, would you just, could we just start praying together that God would do that through us where we are? What will God do? I don't know. And that part's not my business, is it? What did Paul say? Some plant and some water. Where does the growth come from? God. It comes from God. It comes from God. What does he want me to do? Obey. And he'll do what he will, the way he will, in his time and in his way, and in a way that will show me him, a way that will reveal me to me, in a way that will allow me to see his grace and power at work, so that when we see God work, we're able to step back in awe and know for sure that was all him, that was not me. So you look at what Jesus calls us to do and say, I could never do that, you're right. But you can't obey. And let Jesus do through you what he will. Christ will transform you into his productive servant as he uses your obedience to show you his power. Or simply submitting to Jesus will turn sinners into servants. How do I become a servant of Jesus Christ? Obey. Start there. Obey. And let him do what he will do.